Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the sixth and final episode of our Hip and Knee Arthritis webinar series with Dr. Hale. I'm Terry Armstrong. I'm the Marketing Coordinator for Texas Orthopedic Specialists. There's a little bit of our practice, it should show, there we go. Um, our practice is comprised of fellowship trained orthopedic su surgeons and subspecialized doctors. We provide comprehensive orthopedic and sports medicine solutions. And we have um, three offices. Uh, we have one in Bedford, one in Keller Alliance, and one in Denton. There's all our contact information, should you need any of it. Um, today, Dr. Hill will be discussing revision hip replacement surgery. If you missed any of Dr. Hill's previous webinars, they are all available online on our YouTube channel, as well as our Facebook page. And I think those links are here. Yeah, you can find us, um, just search in YouTube, Texas Orthopedic Specialist. You should find our channel. And on Facebook, be sure to like us, follow us. We update and send information through these outlets all the time. So find us, we'd love to have you following us. Um, and I will be posting them all to the, our website as well soon. That's just going to take a little bit longer. But these are the quickest ways to view any of our previous webinars. And just a reminder, please use the questions section to ask any questions you have about today's topic or any of the topics Dr. Hale has discussed throughout this series, anything about hip or knee arthritis, hip or knee replacement surgery, revisions, robotic-assisted knee replacement, anything like that please feel free to ask your questions um, and we'll get to them at the end of today's discussion. All right, Dr. Hale, are you ready for your last and final series? I'm about to change it over to you here in just a second. I think we're pros at this now. We are pros, Terry. <clears throat> Thanks to everybody for joining us today. And we will get started on this last episode. Uh, today we're talking about revision hip arthroplasty and revision hip arthroplasty is a lot like revision knee. You want your first one to be your best one. But if you don't, then then we can oftentimes uh, find a good fix if uh, if the first one hasn't gone so well. So with that, we will start that uh, that now. OK, so. Part six, uh, th these are the previous episodes that we have, and these are all available, as Terry said, on the on the YouTube channel. Today, we're gonna, we will be talking about revision hip replacement. So what is revision arthroplasty? Just like uh, what we saw in the, in the previous one about revision knee arthroplasty, this is a subsequent surgery after a total joint has already been performed. Uh, as opposed to total knees, total hips typically have about a 95 to 98% satisfaction rate uh, and if you'll remember, the total knee arthroplasty population has about a 80 to 85 percent satisfaction rate. So while both surgeries are are quite good, the satisfaction rate and typically that relates to pain control and return of function are much higher with total hips. So the the cause for a painful revision or a revision for a reason that we can't quite figure out is relatively rare in the in the hip as opposed to the knee. <laughs> So a quick review on the uh, different types of components. So this, this shell here, this is a typically a titanium shell. This is called the acetabular component. Uh, you may hear me refer to it as the cup or the socket. This invisible piece that you can't see here between the, the socket and the femoral head is the polyethylene liner. That liner and the head together make up the bearing surface. The, the liner is not always made out of polyethylene, which is which is uh, medical grade plastic. It can be made of other uh, substances, and we'll touch on some of those today. But the gold standard in the United States right now is a uh, is highly cross-linked polyethylene for the liner. The femoral head is this circular piece here, and most of the time that's made out of metal or ceramic. And then this is the femoral component, or also known as the stem. And you'll hear me refer to these different parts of the hip replacement throughout the, the webinar. So reasons for total hip arthroplasty failure. Aseptic means not infected and certain there's many different causes. You can have wearing out of the plastic liner. You can have subsidence or loosening of the component. And that's typically the femoral component. Uh, 
in years past, we had more difficulty with the acetabular component loosening, but that's for the most part gone by the wayside, and that's a very rare complication in 2020. Instability, or what you may have heard of as dislocations or recurrent dislocations, meaning over and over again, uh, is a common problem. Pain is relatively uh, a small proportion of the revisions that we do. Metal on metal reaction was a a major problem in the early and mid 2000s. For the most part, those have all been revised, but we still do see them rarely. You can have a fracture, and then the worst complication of all is sometimes you can have an infection. So this is an example of polyethylene wear or plastic wear. This typically occurs over 15 to 20 years, and, and this still does happen, but to a lesser degree. And we, we still think about 15 or 20 years before this becomes a problem. These, uh, this new plastic that we use was redeveloped about 15 years ago. So we're kind of getting to that period in time where we will either start seeing these new plastic pieces wear out or we won't. Uh, and so quite honestly, we don't know how long this new plastic uh, will last. And personally, I'm hoping it's more on the on the order of 20, 25, maybe even 30 years, but we certainly don't know that at this point. What happens when these plastic pieces wear out is they develop microscopic uh, particles that the blood cells in your body, the white blood cells, which are the disease-fighting cells, will, will realize that those particles are, are in and around the hip and they will try to remove them. Well, as they try to remove them, there's collateral damage, which typically results as bone loss. And you can see that on this x-ray where the yellow arrows are pointing. And you can see above the yellow arrows, the bone is more dense, it's more white and gray. And then down here where the arrows are pointing, it's more black. Well, black in this x-ray signifies lack of bone. And so around the screw holes and up here above the acetabulum or above the acetabular component, you're seeing this bone loss in this area. Another clue that we can look at is these, uh, this, you can see the femoral head is sitting eccentrically in this socket. And so there's a big distance from here to here and a much smaller distance from here to here. And so the, the, this metal head is wearing out the plastic liner in this socket, which is causing the, you know, more and more particles, which is causing more and more collateral damage. And so the treatment for this, and oh, and this is a picture of what it can look like. And so this is the acetabular component here, and you can see where the metal head has worn a hole into the into the metal, and it's, it's completely worn through the plastic here and started to wear into the metal. And so when that happens, you can have even a, an even bigger problem, which is uh, metal shavings, which can cause an even worse reaction than just the plastic particles. So this is a this was a more common problem uh, in the early days of hip replacement surgery. It's become less of a problem now because the plastic's a little bit more tough and lasts longer. But this is a reason why that my patients will, or I, I strongly encourage my patients and anyone that's already had a hip or knee replacement to follow up with their surgeon or, or a surgeon every three to five years to make sure we catch this before the before something catastrophic like this has happened and so a lot of times the treatment can simply be polyethylene exchange where we leave the metal parts the the socket and the femoral stem and we change the the femoral head and the acetabular liner uh, that's typically a very short surgery with minimal bone or minimal blood loss and patients uh, respond and recover from that quite quite quickly. If the bone loss is too bad, if the acetabular component is loose, if the bone loss is extensive, then sometimes it requires a new a new acetabular component to be placed. And then, if the bone loss is very severe, it can require a, a bone grafting procedure or sometimes. Honestly, more often we'll reconstruct the entire pelvis with uh, with a metal reconstruction. You'll see an example of that a little bit later. Subsidence or loosening typically occurs 
like I mentioned before on the femoral side. This can be due to loosening of the cement. Uh, in the early days of hip arthroplasty, most femoral components were cemented. Now we typically press fit or put in stems that we expect to grow the bone to grow into. And so the subsidence now and loosening now is typically due to the failure of the bone to grow into the stem, but it can also be due to cement loosening. It'll present as thigh pain and it can lead to dislocations, it can lead to fractures, it can lead to um, sinking of the stem down into the bone. So this is an example of a patient who had a partial hip replacement and came into my clinic with complaining of dislocation. And we'll, we'll actually see the entire case presented a little bit later in this talk. But the thing, the thing you'll notice is this yellow line is standardized based on this patient's pelvis. And you can see that the, the yellow line goes through the, the lesser trochanter, which is this little bump on the, on the femur. And that line goes right through the middle of the lesser trochanter here, and it's well above the lesser trochanter here. Now, the patient would never have left surgery with that much of a leg length discrepancy. And so we, we can only assume that the femoral components uh, subsided or slipped down, uh, down into the bone. Uh, instability is when the hip dislocates. So something like this. This is actually the a, another case that we'll discuss later, but this is an example of a hip dislocation. And causes can be subsidence, like the last case where the, the femoral stem sunk too far down into the bone, so it's just grossly unstable. It can be due to poor implant positioning, and that can be on the femur side or the acetabular side. It can be due to arthritis in the spine, and this is a newer topic that we're discussing in the world of hip replacement where the due to the arthritis in the spine, the pelvis actually takes on a, a different position to where it, it gets stuck in one position. And so some patients get stuck where their pelvis is more in a standing position and some patients get stuck where their pelvis is in more of a sitting position. Well, then it, as they sit down and stand up, their pelvis doesn't move to accommodate their hip replacement, and that can lead to arthritis their dislocation. And then we always look for infection when someone dislocates because this can cause all kinds of problems. And the last the last thing can be a muscular problem where it, it can be manifested as a uh, compressed nerve from a, a herniated disc or from arthritis in the spine causing uh, a nerve problem to the muscles around the hip causing them not to work. It can be caused by muscle tears that uh, it, that don't allow the um, correct forces to, to be working with that hold the hip in socket. And so just as a general overview, muscle problems can also be a cause, although that's quite rare. So treatment for this uh, if we have subsidence in the stem, meaning the stem sunk too far down into the femur, then we we change the femur, re, re, pre, or recreate the appropriate leg length on both sides, and that typically helps that problem. If you have poor implant position, meaning the socket is in the wrong position, that we can revise the socket. If the stem's in the wrong position, we re, we revise the stem. Sometimes all that you have to revise is the head and liner, and, and that those can be a, a good fix sometimes. If you have spine arthritis, uh, I always start with revising the acetabular component and putting it in a, a position that will allow the um, components to hold the hip in place uh, despite the lack of motion in the pelvis. If it's infection, we treat the infection, and if it's a muscular problem, we may have to revise the the socket, we may have to revise the stem. Uh, we may have to treat the muscle problem, which is nice if we can. For instance, if there's a tear, in order, if we're able to repair the tear, then then usually we can keep the same components. But if the tear is not able to be repaired, or if the problem is uh, nerve-related, meaning that the the nerve has been compressed and so those muscles aren't working anymore, then we have to depend on uh, different. Uh, parts and different components that are available that will hold the socket in place despite the uh, failure of the muscles around the hip. 
this is an example of a patient that had a hip replacement that was that was painful and really there's her only complaint was pain she what she didn't have instability she she didn't have really any other complaints besides pain now whereas in the knee we have to look long and hard for some of those causes of pain in the hip we can usually tell in this patient the the problem is this is a this is a partial hip replacement which was done at a very young age and you can see that her her socket is not actually her native socket doesn't sit where her hip replacement is sitting now up here her native socket is really down here and so this metal head has moved from down here all the way up into the superior aspect of her pelvis and has really you know to borrow a phrase from my childhood has really wallered out this this socket here so the treatment is um, revision of whatever's causing the pain and in this case it was the acetabular component or to be honest the the lack of an acetabular component and then this is the this is her post-operative um, film so you can see that we've lowered the the hip center and we've lowered the socket much further down into here and we've used this little augment up here to to take the place of her or to fill up that oblong um, acetabular uh, defect so this is these are examples of two fractures they can occur anytime and they're they're typically due to major trauma uh, the patient on the left uh, fell he was he, he'd forgotten to put his car into park and uh, the car started rolling and he tried to jump back in and, and fell about three weeks after his initial hip replacement and the patient on the right had uh, had this current hip replacement that you can see uh, and he suffered or sustained a, a additional fall about four or five months after his um, after his first or initial hip fracture so um, the treatment for the, for for uh, prosthetic fractures or fractures around a femoral stem uh, t depends mostly the treatment depends mostly on the uh, stability of the current femoral stem and so in this case he's only had this in place for three weeks and so that hasn't been enough time for the stem to grow into the bone and so this stem's not stable and it has to be changed. Whereas this stem on the on the right picture on your screen, this has been in place for four or five months and it is very well ingrown. And so we can simply fix the fracture and we don't have to change the, the stem. And so their post-operative images look like this. You can these these are wires that have been placed around the fracture to hold it back into place. And then this is a new hip replacement that engages the bone down past the fracture, which offloads the area above and allows it to heal. In this case, in this case, the patient got a long plate, and the, this stem is still functioning really well for him, and uh, and it, the plate enables him to uh, return to his activity. So, metal on metal uh, was a was an issue in the news the it was originally designed to prevent dislocations and so because of the extremely large size of the femoral head it did a really good job of preventing dislocations but the problem was that if the if the components were not placed in perfect position they would point load and cause rather than small plastic particles they would they would cause um, metal particles to be released into the tissue and this created a an incredibly bad reaction which would lead to uh, destruction of the soft tissues specifically the the muscles around the hip as well as the bone around the hip and so metal on metal became what what started out as a really promising technology and hip replacement ultimately uh, ultimately ended up being a, a failure and causing a lot of uh, a lot of problems for for joint replacement surgeons and, and and even more problems for the patients that got them so this is an example of a patient that had a metal on metal hip <clears throat> you can see that this her her femoral head is here and then her acetabular component is here and it's actually you know almost upside down and completely loose and then this patient had even 
you know, even bigger problems because her, she had a, a big fracture here and uh, this part of her pelvis was completely separated from this bottom part of her pelvis. And so this was the reconstruction that, that she required with multiple screws, uh, a revision acetabulum component, multiple screws down into this area, and then a cage over the top that holds the, the cup in and a liner here that holds the ball into place. Infection, uh, this is the most devastating complication that we deal with in, in hip replacement. It typically requires multiple surgeries, long-term antibiotics in, uh, in an IV, which requires some patients to live in a nursing home. Uh, and it, it is, it's a, for lack of a better term, just really, really bad complication. Um, it, we go through a, a pretty big uh, clinical evaluation. We get x-rays. We sometimes need other imaging, such as CT or MRI. We'll always get labs, and then we'll usually take some fluid out of the hip to evaluate and try to figure out exactly what type of infection we're dealing with. And the treatment can be, or a lot of times, the temporary hip replacement, also called a spacer, which is what you see in this x-ray here. Uh, IV antibiotics are usually required for six weeks, followed by uh, oral antibiotics in some patients, and then reimplantation surgery if we're able to clear the infection. Um, the spacer does allow for pretty good function. Um, this is antibiotic loaded cement that you can see around here in the acetabulum, and then antibiotic cement loaded onto this onto this uh, this hip replacement piece here. So it's uh, we, we've come a long way in the treatment of these uh, problems, but but still they they are. Uh, devastating complications for the patients that, that are unfortunate enough to have an infection in their hip. And so I, th I thought this, uh, this is a case of a, a patient that, that I had that uh, turned out to have a uh, multiple different types of, of reasons for, for revision hip arthroplasty. And so I thought we would just go through a, go through a case um, where we can see how, how all this plays out. So, uh, this patient originally presented to the hospital uh, about seven or eight months ago and had a fracture of his femur, specifically the femoral neck, which you can see here, and they were treated with a partial hip replacement. Well, then the partial hip replacement dislocated and then came into my clinic and presented like this, and this is the slide I showed earlier, which shows significant subsidence of the stem and this stem when it was put in uh, was sitting up high like this and then likely was a little bit undersized and slipped down a little bit further and because of the great leg length discrepancy probably you know it's a centimeter and a half two centimeters this just wasn't able the muscles around the hip weren't able to hold that uh, ball in the, in the socket so uh, Went back to the OR, uh, fixed or revised the, the total hip replacement, put in the socket you can see here, uh, new femur, and this recreated the leg length uh, very well. As you can see, the yellow line matches uh, where it passes through both of the um, lesser trochanters on either side. So he, was, he felt better, went to rehab for six weeks, and uh, we were home free. But the day after he discharged from rehab, he dislocated his hip and so uh, we treated this non-operatively put the hip back into socket and he had multiple further dislocations and so now i start asking myself well did it what did i do wrong what does this patient have problems in his spine does he have an infection does he have a muscle problem you know what are the what are the issues and so i went back and looked to you know double check, make sure that my leg links are right, they were, make sure that my, the position of my components is right, and they were. He does not have spine arthritis. He did not have an appreciable tear of any of his muscles. And so uh, we decided let's, let's go back to surgery. And uh, in surgery, he was very, very stable, but at, at, at very extreme positions he was able well, was able to dislocate his hip and so the treatment in that scenario is what we call a constrained acetabular liner 
And so if you look at the close-up view of this of this hip, you can see this white ring that goes around the outside of the socket. Of, and this is um, what this is is pictured here. And so the, the there's the regular acetabular liner, and then the plastic piece actually has um, a lip on the outside that this ball snaps into, and the the liner captures the ball and does not allow it to dislocate. And so it's called a constrained liner, and that's been a a good solution for this patient. He's now four months out and doing well. So. In closing, uh, just like your total knee, your first total knee should be your best total knee. I agree with the, the same is true for your first hip. Uh, optimization is key, and so uh, making sure that blood volume is good, making sure nutrition is good, smoking cessation, weight, all those types of things um, that you'll work with me and your primary care surgeon or your primary care physician to do. Uh, I would consider a fellowship trained total joint surgeon. Um, there's a lot of surgeons that do th that do total hips. Uh, but there's a, there's a few of us that dedicated an entire year of our training to learn how to do these to the best of our ability. And so in, it's my opinion, it's my opinion that you should seek out a fellowship trained uh, hip and knee surgeon. Uh, but, but ultimately you find one that you trust and who you think can do the best job for you. And a uh, final plug for me, if you're not happy with your current total hip, then call anytime and we'll, we'd be happy to see you here in the clinic. Um, I want to say thank you uh, to everybody that's been involved. Thank you. I see several of you that have uh, taken the time to, to tune in to all of these uh, webinars, and so I do truly appreciate them. Appreciate you and your time. Share these with your friends, and uh, special thanks goes to Terry for putting all of this together and for all of her legwork. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions and uh, hand it back over to Terry. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Um, as always, all your webinars have been so informative, and I think you've answered so many questions. Um, so we don't have any right now from any of our viewers, but I wanted to ask you, um, and I feel like you kind of mentioned it, but is there a way to prevent either bone loss or anything after a hip replacement to avoid a revision, or is there anything we can do to ensure that we take good care of our current, like original hip replacements? So from a patient from a patient standpoint, the only thing that I that that I tell everybody to do is make sure that you come back into clinic every three to five years to have an X-ray and to have a checkup because the the double-edged sword of total hip replacement is they feel so good and there's there's such a pain relief after this is done that patients sometimes we'll even forget they've had a total hip replacement because their hip feels so good. Well, then they don't feel like they need to go in and see their doctor and it can lead to uh, problems, big problems that could have been fixed easily uh, if we'd found them earlier. So I do highly recommend uh, at least five year follow up for the life of the hip replacement. Uh, other than that, they're, they're pretty, pretty tough uh, devices and they, they typically do pretty well. When you do a uh, revision, do you do the anterior approach or does, does it depend on where the original was put in or the way it was put in? The, the short answer to that is it depends, but it depends on which, which problem that you're treating. If you're treating acetabular problems, it's easier for me to do it through a posterior approach. Um, and femoral sided problems are, are easier to do through a posterior approach as well. But we, when we do a posterior approach, we do have a higher risk of dislocation. And so it, it, at this point, I'm doing all of my revisions through a posterior approach, but uh, over time I, I plan to do uh, at least some of them through an anterior approach. Okay, and is the recovery the same for revisions as a total joint replacement? Is there anything that's different that people can expect after a revision? Again, it depends on the, the the reason for the revision. If there's massive bone loss, if the surgery is, uh, if it's a bigger reconstruction, if we have to limit weight bearing, then which we typically do, then then the recovery is going to be significantly slower. So uh, I, it's very rare for a revision, uh, the recovery after a, a revision surgery, to be the same as a primary, 
but sometimes it happens, uh, but I would say that's very rare. Usually the revision recovery is uh, more significant. Okay, we have one question. Um, what role does osteoporosis, osteoporosis rather play in hip fracture resulting in a total hip replacement? So uh, a fracture of the proximal femur, meaning the femoral neck or the intertrochanteric region of the femur, so what we call hip, what we call hip fractures, is uh, is is a result of osteoporosis or poor poor bone quality at the femur at the uh, hip. So oste hip fracture from a low energy mechanism, such as a fall from a standing height, which is the vast majority of them is a disease defining illness. Meaning if you weren't diagnosed with osteoporosis and you broke your hip by falling down, well, now you have osteoporosis. And so they play a major role in the cause of hip fractures, um, meaning that the, the cause of hip fractures is almost always osteoporosis. And in fact, the these types of fractures, whether it's of the hip or the wrist or the shoulder, they're actually termed fragility fractures. So your bone's too fragile, you fall down and you break hip now the question of do they does it matter about or does it contribute to needing a total hip replacement and uh so after the fractures happened i don't let osteoporosis dictate my treatment i let the fracture pattern dictate my treatment so if whether i use a total hip or a partial hip or a or even a rod it depends on the the type of fracture that you have when I'm making the decision between a total hip and a partial hip, the, that typically depends on the patient's activity level and the and and I what I think is their potential for recovery and then also their life expectancy afterwards. So if a patient's expected to live greater than five years, then I opt for a total hip because that there's less risk of having the problem that I showed where the, the partial hip had migrated so highly, so far superior. Um, and in order, by doing a total hip, we can avoid that, that problem in those patients. Does that answer the question? I think so. I think we're good to go. Um, is there anything else you wanna say about today's topic or anything you've covered throughout the series? Um, I think that I think we've had a you know six weeks of a uh, bunch of good questions and uh, now that we've we've got all these uh, in the archive on the on the YouTube channel and uh, other spots online so um, I think we can just refer back to those and I want to say thanks again for everybody that was involved. Thank you so much, Dr. Hale, and I'm going to take back over just to share a few um, things with everybody, just again so you can have our. Um, information there's our facebook page there at texas orthopedic specialist our twitter account um, subscribe to our youtube channel to check out all the videos that we've posted of dr hale we also have several videos about our practice and um, we'll be posting other videos from our other providers soon um, and finally if you haven't had a chance to check out dr hale's health grades ratings, I think you should. It's it's very, very great to see what people are saying about Dr. Hill and our other doctors. And if you need to schedule any visits or any consultations with Dr. Hill or any of our doctors here, that's our phone number there. Um, and we are just so thankful that you all joined us and I hope you all have a great week. Thanks. Bye.